Good morning and welcome to the second day of our joint ECB and SRB event, the test of time banking union a decade on. Yesterday, we took stock of the banking union, drilling down into the next steps for crisis management and the resolution framework. And we also had some interesting insights into what's coming next, what the future of banking might be. Today, we shift our focus from the regulators to the banking sector itself, of course, the heart of the banking union. First, we will hear insights from KBC Chief Executive Officer Johan Theiss, and then turn to a panel on how resilient European banks are. As yesterday, we invite you to comment and ask questions via the Mentimeter tool, and you can see the details of how to do that on your screens. With that, let's get started. Please welcome KBC's Johan Theiss, and don't forget to send in your questions for him. Mr. Theiss. So, good morning, uh, Mr. Skönig, Mr. Andrea, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, thank you very much for, uh, for having me here. It's a great honor, great pleasure. Not every day an occasion to speak uh, to such a large audience. I was not aware that 3,000 people are watching us, so I'm pretty stressed. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the financial crisis uh, and its wake, uh, the European sovereign debt crisis clearly illustrated the ma major impact of the financial indus services industry on, uh, on the economy and uh, the reflex of member states to protect national interests and their own banks confronted us with the fact that the European market cannot do without an advanced integration of its financial sector. No doubt about that. The progress that has been made in creating a European banking union since 2012 is positive and has resulted in a more robust, healthy and stable financial sector in Europe. Our recent experience with the pandemic has been a case in point, and one might say that is due to a massive intervention from public authorities or central banks, true, but still. In this case, the commercial banks were part of the solution, whereas in 2008, the commercial banks were part of the problem. Now, we should not take this accomplishment lightly, because implementing a common supervisory and resolution framework for the biggest financial institutions in 19 countries in the Eurozone, each with their own structure, each with their own culture, each with their own operational performance, is quite an achievement. So congratulations. It was also a highly needed achievement, if I may add, because I'm pretty well placed to admit that in the years leading to the financial crisis, banks, commercial banks, have made serious mistakes. As I said, there's no doubt that the ECB and the SRB have done an excellent and thorough job. We cannot, however, stay blind to the fact that a lot of work remains still to be done to mitigate several existing flaws, and we have, should, we should have ambition to complete the work. Or to say it with uh, the quote of a book, let's move from good to great. So let me share with you some critical reflections, and I do apologize in advance. But the goal of the banking union is to create a robust and resilient European financial institution by implementing a comprehensive package uh, of risk reduction measures. This should safeguard national government's budgets from being jeopardized by a potential failure of too big to fail banks. Today, both the single supervisory mechanism and the single resolution mechanism contribute to this goal of creating what is called a level playing field in a stable financial sector. In their approach, both ECB and SRB do their utmost best to treat all financial institutions equally, starting from the concept of a level playing field. Now, in its setup, this is a clearly logical step, and both the ECB and the SRB are applying this strictly to avoid, I think, any legal mistakes. Because, let's face it, Europe is quite complex. And I fully understand that position. But what's the definition of a level playing field? And can that interpretation of level playing field vary upon circumstances? Next to that, and I often hear that, the downside of constantly using the so-called benchmark as the reference for all or for some policies of the industry is putting the bar at the level of the average of the industry. I would even say it puts the bar at the level of the weakest banks. 
And in my opinion, the approach pays insufficient attention to, as I would call them, positive outliers, or if you want to, negative outliers. So let me illustrate what I say to that, and let me use a quite controversial uh, example. Let me refer to the dividend ban for all banks in the early days of the COVID pandemic. One could argue this to be justified as a precautionary measure because it has safeguarded the stability of the financial industry during a very stressed period of the economy. And I fully agree, it has worked out. But was it really necessary? And for me, an easy one. Now to say with hindsight, no, perhaps we could have done differently. Because let's face it, there were some well-capitalized, highly liquid banks, profitable banks, and perhaps the measure which we have taken has caused in that perspective some hampering of the free market approach. And for sure, it has definitely not supported any potential consolidation of the financial industry in the European domain. Consolidation, which is so strongly argued uh, for by the ECB. So it's a quid pro quo. In my view, to strengthen the European banking landscape, once a certain level of stability has been reached, and I repeat, once that uh, level of stability has been reached, a common denominator for a sector benchmark approach applied by a supervisor is not necessarily the right way forward. If a business model proves to be superior to another, if an institution to be, uh, shows to be better performing, um, than others. This should perhaps be more recognized. And the opposite is true as well. If it do worse, it should be recognized as well. And let's face it, in putting everything at the level of the benchmark, it might create a significant concentration risk as well. Now, centralized prudential uh, supervision has reshaped and harmonized how the Eurozone significant banking institutions are supervised and has further aligned the application of EU's single rule book. At the same time, centralized uh, re recovery and resolution planning, as well as dedicated European uh, Eurozone level resolution fund, provide uh, confidence that a crisis in a systemic bank can be managed efficiently and without cost to taxpayers. So notwithstanding the centralized supervision at the European level, National regulators and supervisors continue to play an important role, both in sharing and shaping uh, regulation as well in day-to-day -day supervision, as these national authorities have an understandable national tendency to give priority to national interest. This implies that on the field, the banking union is not yet as much as reality as one could hope for. Ring fencing is still alive and kicking. And you could say it's a bit more subtle than it was before, for good reasons. Now, regulation is still interpreted differently across EU member states, resulting in different practices in day-to-day -day supervision across the EU. Now, we as commercial banks notice a clear difference in the interpretation of regulation between different member states. Uh, being CEO of a group which is across Europe, under SSM, NOSM, SSM, SSM countries, we clearly make, um, we clearly notice that difference. And a certain discrepancy between non-SSM member states is understandable, to a certain extent. But even within SSM countries, we can't help notice that European supervisors turns a blind eye when it comes to aligning the implementation of European rules. And we wonder why. Although we agree that robust and healthy banks are necessary to create a safe financial system that can absorb shocks and crises, we must always keep in mind that we act in a competitive global market and that providing financial services to the European economy should be both convenient and acceptable prices for our customers, because that's the reason why we are here. We are not here for us. We are not here for for us supervisors, we are not here for us commercial banks. Now, a strong EU economy requires healthy and competitive banks. And that's what it starts with. This is something that should be considered more in regulation, more in supervision, more by us. I have a clear message in this respect. Please 
to cut the red tape. The enormous complexity and disproportionate amount of information required by the supervisor comes at a significant cost for the banks, probably for you as well, and therefore the overall economy is hampered as fact as well. It is of utmost importance that this money is well spent. And to illustrate a little bit, let me give you a couple of examples. The first example, I would like to refer to time and energy consuming fit and proper process preceding the nomination, for instance, of a director to the supervisory board or a member to the executive committee or whatever, a member and an appointment of a senior general manager in very specific roles. This process is lasting months. And I'm not speaking one or two months, I'm speaking about a multiple of that number. And in the meanwhile, those positions are vacant. And we are waiting. Same can be said about the um, yeah, approval process of acquisitions. And you know, next to the very cumbersome and sometimes very painful administrative process, which goes along with, with that approval process, the throughput time of such an approval process is very long, and very long. Now, I'm the first one, and I think all my colleagues will follow, to recognize the complexity of such an approval and the importance of doing it right. I fully agree. But does it need to take so much time? Seriously? You know, we need to be aware that the acquired company, the acquired assets, the acquired liabilities, the, employee, and the employees in that acquired entity are during, during the long approval process subject to scrutiny by the markets, scrutiny by the, the competition. And this leads to financial impact for the acquirer. And I know one could say, so be it, it's your problem. I agree. But it also may lead to destabilization of the acquired entity. And that's no longer our problem, but it is our problem. You include it. Another case in point, KBC is required to deliver 5,880 reports and templates to the authorities, supervisory authorities. Let me repeat, almost 6,000 reports. It was 4,700 three years ago, so it's an increase of 20%, which is quite a lot, even if the number 4,700 was a lot in itself. Now, this enormous workload implies a significant financial cost. And to illustrate, to create all those reports, I mean, the system in itself, not the generation of every, every single uh, report of every single template, um, KBC has set up a project with a total investment cost of 200 million euro and counting. Now, interesting to note that in times of crisis, uh, we have experienced a couple of them in the recent past, um, we did not use a lot of those reports. And the same is true for the supervisors. They only use the limited number of those reports. And I would say, you know, I could count them on one hand, the fingers of one hand perhaps the fingers of two hands. But still, why do we need to issue all those reports? What concerns me even more, that is a potential next step. Uh, the supervisory authorities may request tomorrow access to the underlying database, which yeah, triggers an interesting point of discussion. But it allows them for sure to distill out of that data their own reports and present them, or at least the conclusions derived from those reports or those data analysis to us. And this would, what I would call, this kind of uh, reporting, I would call it direct reporting, this would create a very strange reporting stranglehold. Because, you know, the outcome and interpretation of any kind of report, of any kind of template, is strongly depending on the knowledge of the underlying businesses, and therefore is not necessarily unique. This would often lead to what one could call reconciliation problems with us. And as a consequence, a lot of extra labor to be done. So I'm not necessarily a fan. You know, anyway, it would generate potentially for both sides an extra cost. And what's the added value? Now, the fact that different authorities require the same or different information without proper coordination makes a bank often the object of an international and an institutional ping pong game. Um, ECB and SRB sometimes take opposite stances on the same problem, leaving banks in limbo. 
how to deal with the situation. Being the CEO of a group of 45,000 employees, I sometimes wonder if top managers, me included, knows what's really go going on on the lower levels, at the lower levels of the organization. When people in the big organization, well intended, execute tasks within the framework set by top management, the outcome and definitely the way how the work is delivered may differ from the original intent. And I'm still speaking about my own institution. But why would it be different at supervisory authorities? Why would it be different in supervisory institutions? Too often it is said by senior officials, well intended, that according to the information provided by their own organization, that nothing is wrong or that banks are exaggerating. But believe me, there is a significant proportion of inefficiency embedded in the current supervisory system. And I started with saying that you guys are doing a great job. Finally, the banks organize, the way banks organize and operationalize their business models should not lead to unfair regulatory consequences for financial institutions depending on the way how they are set up, even if the underlying risks are exactly the same. And in that perspective, I also support the call from the head of the UK Prudential uh, Regulation Authority to simplify the capital requirements framework and to do away with an array of extra capital cautions, such as pillar two add-ons by supervisors, capital conservation buffers, and countercyclical buffers. Now, how can we get forward? We all know that a piece of the puzzle of the European Banking Union is still missing. It is European deposit insurance schemes for bank deposits in the euro area. Currently, we still have different national deposit guarantee schemes, we all know, and this should be resolved by introducing that overarching European scheme, um, which then would provide a stronger and more uniform degree of a euro insur insurance cover, ensuring that the level of deposit of confidence would not depend on the bank's location as a consequence on the member state. Therefore, we do regret that the Europe, Europe Group's in recent, recent initiative to revamp the project has been put on hold by the member states, and we hope, nonetheless, that further progress will be made in the near future. Now, although we are in favor of adding this essential third pillar to the banking uh, union framework, let me raise a couple of intention points. First of all, I'm wondering what happens to the contributions that already have been made to national guarantee schemes, regardless if the local governments have set them aside in a separate fund or not? And this is, of course, not a message to you, but this is a message to other people as well. Will, we de will those funds be transferred to European level? Question mark. And we're talking about big amounts. Secondly, EADIS implies solidarity between all the banks of the banking union. That's why it's set up. Although the difference in risk profiles between those financial institutions can still be quite significant. Hence, it's my opinion that solidarity cannot be achieved when there are no equal obligations in terms of capital requirements of risks that banks take. Particularly, for example, if the amount of bad loans is not cut by us below a certain threshold, or if sound profitability levels triggered by us are not achieved. So complementary to the banking union, it's paramount that we further step into the integration of, Europe, the integration of European capital markets. Divergence in national regulations and taxation regimes hamper the creation of a European capital markets union. And we know that it is a patchwork of, uh, of tax systems, indeed, in Europe. But strengthening a real banking union needs to have a more uniform financial or capital markets union. And today, European companies are disproportionately reliant on banking financing in comparison to the markets such as the USA. Now, the creation of a capital markets union would therefore provide an opportunity to balance the scale and lead to a healthier financial financing mix. And the definition of healthier, I leave up to your uh, interpretation. As a side note, I would like to add that 
the much hard reference uh, to the U.S. capital markets as the ultimate, finan fin uh, the ultimate final outcome for the EU does not take into account the specific setup and features of the different markets. Example giving the regulatory context in Europe is completely different than the U.S. capital markets. On top of this, the reality of financial services evolves quickly and our regulatory supervisory framework needs to keep pace. New actors in the field of decentralized finance, digital currency, stable coins, crypto, I mean, they are disrupting the financial services and in order to, main, uh, to maintain stability, supervisor regulators must take these into their scope, into their attention. Fortunately, awareness amongst regulators, supervisors, is rising, as illustrated by recent uh, statements by the national supervisors, amongst which the ECB, amongst which also uh, FED, Bank of England, and I can continue. But we need to move faster. And if we would allow the new marketplaces, not new market players, sorry, to roam free the risks of a new financial crisis would become much more imminent. Building upon this topic, I grandly support, and I greatly support, the ECB's effort in creating a digital euro, or what is then called the central bank digital currency. It's my strong belief that the current evolution towards digital money is inevitable, and it would be wise to acknowledge this by all of us. And I will re repeat, us means including commercial banks. For good understanding, I'm not referring to the so-called stable coins, but I'm really referring to um, digital money issued by central banks and having the legal status of money. In my view, central banks should take the lead into developing a digital currency, one that central banks control themselves. I would say one which allows to build an economy upon. Discussions on the position of the commercial banks in such a system is of course part of the debate, I agree. And let's say it differently, let's not drag our feet, because let's be clear, private players across the globe, big techs or not, will not hesitate to take the place of our monetary institutions when they are offered the opportunity. Nonetheless, we should remember that significant benefits that the banking union could deliver to European citizens. Like a chair, a different one than these ones in the room, but like a chair, the banking union needs each of its legs to be strong and balanced if this, if this should be working as it should. Now, I have had the opportunity and the privilege to witness the unfolding of the EU banking union project from the front row as a CEO of KBC Group since 2012. A lot of achievements are a fact. And as I said, a lot of achievements can be qualified as good. But a lot of challenges are on the road in front of us. I realize, and I apologize in advance, that some of my comments may be highly critical on certain topics. but. We, commercial banks and supervisors, are having the same interest and are working together better. On the level of equals, we will be able to tackle successfully the upcoming challenges to the benefit of the European consumer and corporate institutions. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Mr. Tice. We have a couple of questions from our online audience, but first I'll see if there's any questions in the room. Any hands raised? I don't see any, so we'll give the preference to our online audience. So coming back to your remarks about fit and proper and acquisitions, what would be your proposals to make those processes lighter? I mean, first of all, um I, I, I said it's not an easy process, it's a complex process, and we have to take into the supervisors have to take into account a lot of measures. Obviously, you have a huge amount of difference in the different regulations, tax systems, and so on and so forth. But for the strict approval process, um, 
whereby I'm referring to um, not necessarily anti-competition, but the strict approval process of the ultimate ownership and so on and so forth, that process can be significantly speeded up. Definitely, when financial institutions have been on a recent, in a recent time frame doing exactly the same transactions, the same uh, acquisitions, that process can be easily, easily copied on the back of what was experienced six months, eight months, 12 months, 20 months before. And, you know, it looks perhaps exaggerated, but we are talking about processes which goes nine months, 12 months. And in, that, in those circumstances, we need to be aware that the acquired assets, but I said it as well, the, the acquired staff, including the, st the staff of the acquired entity, is under scrutiny. And sometimes the administrative process is too burdensome. Thank you very much. Any questions in the room? Fabia? Thanks a lot. Uh, just one question. Um, you mentioned integration as, as something that is needed, uh, further integration. My question would be, um, given the regulatory framework, are the banks also leveraging as much as they can on the framework to move in that direction? Is there something more that you can also do with the, with the current framework? No, Thank you. I spoke on several occasions on integration. Which specific part are you referring to? Financial integration, more cross-border activities, more European uh, yeah. financial integration. So I think indeed, let me first say something which is perhaps pretty strictly personal and not necessarily shared by colleagues. I'm not convinced that big is always better, uh, for good understanding. So in that perspective, integration, consolidation, and so on and so forth, yes, OK, but uh, it needs to fit the purpose. So I'm personally more convinced that when it fits the purpose, and the purpose can be on different occasions strategic, I mean, the ultimate goal is to serve customers better and to have a stable financial institution so we can guarantee the long-term purpose which I just said. So if, you, if it makes sense from a strategic perspective, it makes sense from a financial perspective, creating stability, income, profitability can be translated in higher capital ratios and higher returns ultimately to your shareholders and then a good service to your customers. If all those boxes are ticked, Consolidation makes sense. And in order to facilitate, and, 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 and I assume the ECB Europe in, in general is indeed fostering the same position, if those boxes are ticked, the system should facilitate. Now, what's the system? The system is the regulatory part, the supervisory part for sure, but also the political part, also the tax system, and so on and so forth. And then within Europe, we have quite a lot of differences which hamper that. Uh, I touched upon one of them, that is how to protect the deposit of, of uh, policy of deposit holders within the European frame. This is fundamentally different. So if you go into a consolidation, often we are, as financial institutions, confronted with those differences, which hamper integration. Thank you very much. And maybe a, a last question. It's quite a broad question, but you mentioned you have been in the front seat watching the evolution of the banking union since its conception. So if you had a magic wand, what would you as a banker wish to see from politics and regulation for your industry and the consumer? In, in, in brief, or we have in half an hour now? You have brief. <laughs> um, I think, you know, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm twisting it from both angles. Eh? Mm -hmm. So I'm twisting it from the angle of a commercial institution, but also from the angle of uh, uh, um, a supervisor. Let's work better together. I think we all have the same goal. You know, we're on the same ship. And the same ship is providing financial services to fulfill customer needs. And if we understand good from both sides what that means from our side, I mean, let's face it, we need to be able to generate capital so we create stability so we can guarantee to our deposit holders and so on that we will be there even in a moment of crisis. If we fully understand and grasp that position and supervisors facilitate that in a very effective, also effective in terms of administration and so on, way of working, then I think we're both doing things together. So it's not they should, but it's we should. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Mr. Heiss. Please thank you, Mickey. Thank you.